All right, it's two o'clock. Let's roll. Okay, super. Welcome everybody to our webinar on acquisitions and mergers and valuations. And there's all kinds of good information that you're going to learn today from some of the best professionals in the industry. Just as a reminder, sometimes when you unmute yourself, we can hear everything you're saying, including thank you for calling all states. So be cognizant of that. And then also watch going too off of topic because you know we're gonna to try to keep this short and sweet, but give you all the information that would be valuable to you. And we know how precious your time is. So we don't wanna to go too off topic and we really wanna stay focused. So please remember that. And again, if you, if you feel like you need to say something and maybe the timing isn't right, you are welcome to email me, Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N, at craigwigginscoaching.com. And I will absolutely make sure that your question either gets answered live or I will reply to you personally or one of these guys will um, after the webinar is over. But we will have time for Q&A at the end. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A as well. But if you feel like, oh, I don't know if I want everybody to see this question, you can either private message me there or on email. So on that note, Craig, you want to take it away? Absolutely. Thanks so much. And guys, You're welcome. You. Appreciate you joining the call today and appreciate these guys um, jumping on with us. Um, we've got Justin Slocum, Greg Blanchard, Paul Clark, um, of course, Brad from our team. And, you know, we get a lot of questions, been getting a ton of questions around mergers and should I merge should I not merge um what about the upcoming changes regarding purchases and will I be able to merge then and a lot just a lot of questions around that there's a town hall you know where that question was actually asked and sounds like there may be some news coming with that this summer so what I thought we'd do is just have a call to talk about a lot of this including valuation there's been a lot of questions and conversation around the um the PPC index so why not just get the man on himself to explain and talk through some of that, provide some context. So first what I want to do is just maybe get, maybe get Justin to chime in a little bit on this part where it seems like we're getting the question every day, should I merge or maybe why shouldn't I? Merge? It's so funny how you, you always want what you can't have. So everybody's all ready to merge. And then they, then they say you can, now you start wondering, should I do it or should I do it? So Justin, I know you, you know, you got a bunch of locations um, and you're going through this process right now. Why don't you just talk a little bit about maybe why, why you're doing what you're doing and maybe some things for people to think about if they're in a, a similar situation so we can, you know, help people work through this. Definitely. I think there's a, a lot that you need to take into consideration if you're going to do this. Um, for me, as many of you know, I have five locations and a lot of what we have been doing over the years is learning how to do remote or virtual employees. That's something that is beneficial for me. So if I go down to one location, I've already got my real estate expense covered and all that, but there's a lot I still have to factor in. My Google SEO, what am I gonna do there? Cause now I'm losing four Google ads that can run out there. And uh, when people are searching for Justin Slocum Allstate and Grand Prairie or auto insurance in Grand Prairie, I'm not gonna have that anymore. So that's gonna go away. So you've got to consider that. If you're doing a lot of local marketing um, in regards to mail and you're using that address, there's a lot of times that they open that up and they want to do business with someone local. Um, so you're not going to have that. You're not going to have that walk in. Um, you've got to consider all those different expenses or all your expenses in regards to rent, utilities. I talked to a lot of people. They've got a $5,000 a month rent that could make a big difference if they didn't have that today. But if you've got a $600 a month rent, that's really not going to change the fact if you merge up, that's not gonna be that much money to make a difference. Um, being open for me, staffing a location from nine to five is another thing you've gotta consider. Um, you've got five of them now, so five locations gotta be staffed nine to five, pre-COVID, you know, and I'm sure that, that rule's gonna apply as we move forward um, with any location that they have in regards to that. So um, the other thing would be your, just your marketing strategy overall. If you're doing a lot of um, things like for us, when we merge, we are going to merge into one location. I made the decision to finally do it. But Craig's right. I've said it for probably two or three years. I wish I could merge. I wish I could merge. They said yes. And I'm like, where's the strings? Why is it there's something wrong here? And so I kept thinking that. But at the end of the day, there's not. They're just saying, hey, we're going to allow you if you're within 40 miles, go ahead and do it. If it benefits you, the goal is there that they will grow. So if you do this and you don't grow and you just stick the money in your pocket, it's probably not going to be beneficial later on for them to do this for other people later on. 
Um, so this goal is to really grow by 10, 15, 20% for every agency. Um, and I plan to do that. I've, I would have committed to that prior to this, but I really am going to do that. For me, I'm going to sell a few of the buildings. I don't really need them. So we're going to have that injection of income instantly. I'm probably going to pay off two loans. I have two loans left on two, um, two buildings, but you also need to factor that in. What's that tax going to look like? You know, get with your CPA on that. Does it make a smart, is it a smart move for me to sell those or not? Um, so there, those are all the things that I factored into my decision. I'm still doing it. Um, but if I wasn't prepared with people working remotely at home, I probably would have went down to two or three locations to be able to house them because wherever they live at, if they need to be able to drive to a location and now you're taking them 40 miles another direction, they're probably not going to work for you. Or if you don't have a way for them to work from home, they're not going to be able to work for you. So I think you definitely need to factor in the staff side of that is the biggest play. Yeah. And the other thing that I would add to that is that, you know, there are times where maybe, maybe you don't want to do it because you're getting close to where maybe you're going to make an exit. And sometimes it's easier to sell those books that may be a little bit smaller in size versus one really big one. Right. So if you've got several locations, a four or five million dollar agency might be a lot marketable, more, more marketable and get more people to qualify for than a 15 or 20 million dollar book. Maybe, maybe not. And one thing that you might think about that, I, I don't know if it really, if, if that's been addressed in any of these conversations or not, is maybe you could co-locate. Maybe you could keep those agency numbers alive, you know, in that one location. If your strategy or your plan is to maybe get out in the next few years, maybe it would make more sense for you to co-locate put all of them under one roof, but still have those two or three or four different, you know, agencies still be separate right. from one another. And that way allow you to get rid of the expense. So that may be something else for you to consider. If um, they allow the co-location, I would co-locate a hundred percent for that, that exact reason. And, and Paul maybe can speak to this, but for me, I could see the market being a lot bigger for a $5 million, three to $5 million agency on who can buy it versus jumping out there at 15, 10, 20 million dollar agency. And you're just going to narrow that market and who can afford it, who can get approved for a loan like that to be able to take that book. And also just be approved by Allstate. They just they're not going to let anybody walk in and take on a 20 million dollar agency. So um, I think that's something Paul could speak to. And if it were up to me and they allow me to co-locate, I will do that. If they don't, my backup plan is a subproducer code for each location. You can run your business metrics by a subproducer code. So that is how I will do that if there's not the option for co-location. And before Paul weighs in, I saw where Gina just said, she just made a comment, Gina Eubanks on the Q&A said, if you co-locate, you had to go IS. So that would be a, that'd be a huge challenge. That, that, that was previous. I, there actually is talk about allowing it without right now. I, I had this conversation yesterday. So um they understand that it's going to be very hard for an exit, exit strategy if they don't allow the co-location. Um, so there's talks about it without IS. I'm not, I'm not saying they're going to do it. They're just considering it because we have, there's a lot of people that have raised concern myself. I don't know if Greg's considering that on his or not, but when we merge, it would be nice that if I could peel off 5 million and, you know, when I start getting closer to retirement and say, I want to sell this 5 million and it's a solid book, the books all together. We don't have to pick apart zip codes or anything like that. Paul Clark's got a business metrics he can look at and say, wow, that's a solid book. Let's do that or not. You know, what do you think about that, Paul? Yeah, it's a, it's a great conversation. Um, my personal opinion is if you looked at three locations, 5 million each versus one location, 15 million trying to sell all, sell all of it to one person, you probably get about the same valuation, but if you were selling three $5 million books, you'd get more cash at closing as the seller. And to me, that's probably the most important thing because whenever we're um, asking sellers to seller finance a portion of a transaction, that's typically the riskiest part of the transaction because I'm in first position, the seller's in second. So my piece is not very risky. The seller piece is substantially risky. So if you were selling three $5 million agencies, you could easily get well over $3 million in cash, three and a half, maybe even four at closing. Um, if you're trying to sell a $15 million single location to one buyer, I think it would be tough to get the same amount of cash unless you got really lucky with your buyer, somebody who had exceptional financial condition, qualified for maximum loan and had a down payment. 
Can you explain maybe a little bit more about why that would work out? Like, why would you get more cash with those three separate buyers than just the one? Uh, absolutely. So um, each individual borrower that Allstate approves, an approved buyer, typically, out, uh, and I'm specifically talking about outside buyers here. If you're selling to an existing agent, totally different story. But each outside buyer typically from an underwriting perspective, will have a limited amount of exposure that they can take on from any banking partner's standpoint. I mean, so most of these eight, uh, agent candidates coming in, um, they look about the same. They all typically have good credit. They all have pretty good work history and they all have net worth fairly similar. I mean, most of these folks have 50 to 150,000 liquid um, a lot of them have net worths between 250,000 and a million dollars. So for us to lend those individuals, um, let's say a $1.2 million on a $5 million book is a pretty easy thing to do. And then they might be able to throw in another hundred, 150,000 as a down payment. So the seller's getting in excess of a million three on each of those sales. So close to $4 million. Now you take that same individual and they're coming to us saying, hey, I'm buying a $15 million book for four and a half million dollars. And I still only have a hundred thousand to put down. Um, my, loan ex my loan exposure relative to the book is probably gonna be smaller. So instead of doing 2.3, 2.4 times, I'm probably gonna be closer to two just because the total exposure is larger. And then you only have one down payment from your buyer. So perspective, I'd rather be selling Unless I hit the buyer lottery, you know, I tell people that all the time. We don't see it very often, but every once in a while, you'll hit somebody who had a financial windfall. Um, maybe they had a large inheritance. You know, I saw somebody put down like a million five. It was all their inheritance money. They put all of it down on a large agency purchase. That's really hard to find. I mean, as a seller, you can't sit around and wait for a buyer that has a million dollars in cash or greater. If you have a $15 million agency, that's just, you could be waiting forever, especially wherever you're located, um, you know, to be able to find that individual and, and they want to put all that cash in an all state agency, that's really hard to come by. So um, moving $5 million books. And if you look at the all state agency value index, I've started putting the average size agency that that's financed on there. And I think the average last quarter was like 4.1 million. So for the market and for lenders in general, I think that's kind of a sweet spot. You're three to 6 million in premium. Those deals are really easy to get done. Um, and I don't wanna speak for all the lenders out there, but those are, those are pretty cookie cutter deals. I mean, they're gonna have good cash flow. You know, you're gonna be managing a few staff folks and they're, they're, they're fun deals for us to lend on. Okay. Um, hey, Justin, we've got a question from Riga. I'll let you speak on this before I let Greg talk a little bit about maybe some upcoming stuff is, you know, Riga wants to know, you know, what happens to the business metrics when you merge, you know, when, when you, when you purchase a book and you merge and we, we all kind of know the answer to that. Why don't you talk about that a little bit and what maybe people need to think about, um, you know, if they're looking, if they're facing that type of situation, not merging the existing books, because all, all the ones you have now, they all roll up anyway. So it's not really that big of a deal, but when you go buy one and we'll let Greg talk about maybe what's coming in the next few months, but, can you speak to that just for a few minutes and talk about what people need to be thinking about? Because there are some serious um, considerations when it comes to that. Definitely. I, I think you, in regards to your business metrics, if you're going to, if I was going to take three and put them in one and two in another, you can run that in your business metrics. Now just go in and select those three agencies. That'll show you exactly what that business metrics is going to look like um, in regards to buying another one if that day comes at the end of summer or next year, if that does show up and I'm sitting here at 85% on a $20 million agency and you go to buy somebody that's 74% on a $4 million agency and you're going to merge that in, you're of course going to come down some. It, it's all based on just math. I mean, you just have to run the numbers on it and go from there. You can ask, now there used to be a department, the department I have here in Texas is gone. But there is, if you ask your FSL or you call 1-800-ALLSTATE and you get the pound six and um, have them look into it, you can ask, if you're going to purchase a book, you can ask for a um, 
guess or not, I guess it's not a guesstimate, but basically a guesstimated business metrics um, after the fact. And they will try to put something together with yours and their um, business metrics and merge them together just so you can get an idea of what that looks like, how far they've went backwards. You're going to know it from theirs. And if you're good at math, you can just run it down yourself um, and see. But really, if you're going to put those together, you've got to consider the ALR piece of it. Um, you're going to go up times 12 normally on whatever their policy count is. And then, so you've got that to always, that's probably the biggest thing I see that everyone kind of, hey, this is great. We're going to run in here and do this. But if you don't hit that, you don't hit the bonus, period. So if you're chasing a bonus, you're not going to get that if you don't get the ALR piece. So um, I'd say that's big to consider. And then most people undershoot what they need to grow by. So if you take those numbers, I've built a spreadsheet. And if you ever have a question like that, I just take my numbers. I put the new business metrics into my little spreadsheet and it pops out how much I think I need to grow by 15%. And that number is normally about 50 items higher than where people think they should be selling at because they're buying the agency in June or July or something like that. This agency's typically when they're selling, not always, but typically they're going backwards or sitting flat. And um, you've got to outrun that because those were supposed to be growing by 10 or 15% as well. So those are the things I look at whenever I come into one. All right, good deal. And keep the questions coming, guys. We'll, we'll answer as many as we can while we got the time today. But I want to I talk to Greg for just a couple minutes about the possibility. And look, nobody, I think any, anybody like has any secret information or anything like that. And I don't think Greg can't talk about anything um, that is, you know, confidential at this point. But I think we all kind of have like a gut feeling about where things might be headed in terms of being able to, to buy and merge in. So Greg, you want to talk about that just for a couple of minutes about maybe what, what might be coming and then what people can do if that's what they want to do to position themselves to, to take advantage of that. Yeah, Craig, thanks for that, uh, for that introduction. And, and guys understand because I sit on the AEC, there's some things that I cannot discuss specifically due to NDA, but I will tell you that what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're going to position yourself um, to, try, to try to get to the elite um, level as far as segmentation goes. There's going to be a lot more benefits that come from the segmentation piece. And I know sometimes that it's easier said than done. But I think if you follow what the company's objectives have been since this transformational growth you know, program has been put into force was that they want to grow, you know, figure out how to convert um, some of your service people into salespeople, get automated, spend more in marketing. Um, I know for us, last year was the best year that we ever had. This last month was the best month I ever had on record. So maybe Florida got lucky. I mean, but it's, it's due to a lot of hard work. And I am putting my trust inside of Allstate to be able to hire up and uh, make sure that I'm still at that elite level. Um, I, I do believe that with elite in the summer, there are going to be some conditions. I don't know what the conditions are. Or at least I can't share the specific conditions, but I do believe that in the summer, the, the, the acquisition and the merger is going to be taking place. And for those of you that are looking to uh, grow, in my opinion, historically, the fastest way to grow is through acquisition. Uh, it gives you more cash flow. You don't have to deal with you know, physical location space, hiring, marketing, market spend, employment, all those different intangibles that go into the solution of trying to get to the next lever in, ter in, lever in terms of scope and size that you want to attain in, inside your professional business. So I know about, I've got four locations. I plan on merging my office that's down the street with one of my other locations. The uh, Northern office is more than 40 miles away from me. So I'll have a separate, obviously, location still over there and then one down South. But I think for those of you that it makes sense for with multi-locations, absolutely do it because if Allstate gives you the opportunity to merge, you merge if it makes financial sense. Don't look back because that obviously could change so that's why I was the, one of the first people to get out there and actually sign my form to get the merger. And I just actually heard from somebody today and my merger consultation is ha happening next week. So you guys should probably start to see that in your email boxes today. Good stuff. Well, look, we got a ton of questions. I'm going to let Allison kind of moderate these questions, but I want to let you guys know also that Greg, Justin, and myself are also going to be doing some brokerage services. If you're thinking about buying, if you're thinking about selling, you can go to craigwigginsbrokerage.com and uh, we'd be glad to talk with you about whatever it is you're wanting to do, whether you're trying to, to buy or trying to sell or just get a valuation. 
feel free to reach out to us um, through that website or obviously through email, Facebook, whatever, and we'll be glad to help you. Um, but Ali, let's let's get through as many of these questions as we can because we got a ton of them in here, and I want to make sure that we answer as much as possible during this. So can you kind of moderate through there and we'll sure. figure we can answer it the best? Absolutely. Okay. So this is just a comment by somebody. They said, I just submitted an MBL business plan in Florida. No IS required. So I'm just communicating that to the group. And then this one is directed at Paul. It says a few years ago, the larger the agency, the larger the loan factor was. Now, from what I hear, that is not true you were saying, I believe, what caused this to change? Yes, let me clarify the point I was making with Craig on the three $5 million books versus 115. You're still gonna get, the bigger the book, you're still gonna get the best multiple or value. What you're not gonna get once you get too so large is you're not gonna get the same amount of cash at closing. So it's still better to be big. Um, if you go back and look at all the value indexes, I'd break out zero to 2 million in premium, which is always the lowest multiple, two to 4 million, which is typically the next highest. And then your 4 million and up is uh, always the highest multiple received um, by size group. So I, I just wanna make sure we stand, understand the difference between cash at closing to the seller and market value. So you're still gonna get, if you've got 15 million or 5 million, you're probably gonna get about the same multiple, 15 million might even get a higher valuation, market valuation. However, the amount of cash you're likely to get at closing um, is likely, not in every instance, but is likely to be greater if you have three $5 million books selling to three individuals that can qualify for three loans and three down payments versus one. So that's a, that's a fantastic question. I'm sure I didn't highlight that enough, but you're not losing valuation. You're just likely losing how much cash you would get at closing in a single sale, in a single sales transaction if you're selling just the $50 million book. So that's a really good question. Okay, that makes I'll sense. Add, I'll add to that real quick, just on the valuation though. A lot of times, if you think of it from a real estate aspect, if you go to sell a broken house, that value is lower. If you've got an inner circle lead agency that's rocking and rolling, your valuation is gonna be bigger. If I'm coming in and I have to fix a bunch of stuff, I'm getting it purchased right. My valuation on that book is gonna be a lot less but if I'm coming in and buying an agency that hits inner circle every year, it's a well old machine, that thing's sitting at 90% retention, bundled up, ALR strategy in place. There's a lot higher value to an agent, whether that's outside buyer or existing agent buying you. So I think if you're going to get out and you want the best multiple, make sure you're setting that agency up for success to get that valuation that you want. And Justin, and that's a, go ahead. Before we go to more questions, I want Paul to speak. This is one of the main reasons I got him on here today. I want you to talk a little bit about the index and where yes. that comes from and what may be, because I think a lot of people, they look at this index and they start to freak out that their, you know, their, their valuation is plummeted and now it's, it's dropping like a rock. Talk about what's going on with what you guys are publishing in regards to that index and what maybe people could think about in terms of where they are with their own books. Yes. So Craig, I'll start by saying, I was glad to hear you guys are working on a brokerage company because I think a lot of folks in the industry need a little help in knowing kind of where their book should fit. Um, the value index is coming out in less than two weeks. And I took, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about why values are where they're at. I spent a lot of time talking about what the purpose of the valuation value index is. And for me, it's always been one to bring clarity uh, to the market because a lot of individuals had no idea what to sell their business for. Um, but I wanted to make sure people had a starting point for negotiations. That's all the value index is. It's an average of a lot of sales. And some of those sales multiples are very high for very quality books. And some of them are very low for poor quality books. And I was just pulling the value index up on my computer while you were talking. If you look at just the second quarter of 2020, so that's just a three month period, just the transactions PPC loan was involved with. And I started producing a high and low because honestly, Craig, the, the biggest question or piece of feedback I always get is, okay, I'm trying to figure out exactly the dollar amount that my book should sell for. I'm 3 million. And I see that the two to 4 million value is 0 0.241. So how do I do the math on that? What's the dollar my business should sell for? And it's a little frustrating because 
I always try to explain to people, hey, this is an average. So we need to take care and understanding, okay, should your book be worth more than the average? Should it be worth less? What are some positive attri attributes about your business? What are some areas for improvement? But going back to my point here, on the second quarter 2020, just a three month period, the lowest multiple we saw a book sell for was 1.0 times. And the highest multiple we saw a book sell for was 3.22 times. And I think you and I talked about this a couple months ago, Craig, when we were getting this conversation going, this is not like real estate transactions. Like real estate in my neighborhood, every house sells for between 140 and $150 a square foot. That's it. There's no wiggle room. That's just the market. Okay. So the variance that somebody's going to get for selling their house in my neighborhood is not very much. You might get a little premium because your yard's lots a little bit bigger or this or that nice garage, whatever. In all state, the variations in valuation are all over the place. I mean, you can have somebody who has uh, non-vested TPP that's terminated. You can have a fantastic agency with great staff that's a turnkey operation that's very profitable to the owner and is great retention. Um, I mean, you look at the, 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 the variation in sales multiples and it honestly, you know, we have to do a lot of vetting and assisting our, our applicants, especially a lot of first-time purchasers, because they don't really know what to pay. And they don't necessarily know to gauge what are the positive aspects of this agency? What are some negative areas that I'm going to have to deal with after I purchase? And so I've always, I don't want to say been concerned, but always uh, kind of wish there was more professionals helping buyers and sellers in the market, because there's only so much I can do as a lender, right? Right. I've, I've never owned an agency. I do have to stay in my lane a little bit. It's like lawyers, you know, I can't tell people how to word a purchase agreement because it's practicing law without a license. There's certain things I can and can't do as the lender. And so I'm really excited to hear you guys are doing that because, you know, deals were all over the place. I mean, I can tell you horror stories about, you know, se uh, sellers calling me up saying, hey, I'm selling to my staff member for five times you know, make sure you tell her it's a good deal or the widow, that, <laughs> the widow whose husband recently passed away. And I, this is, was a real deal in California. It was over $4 million book with 95% retention. And the approved buyer told the, uh, the widowed spouse that it was only worth TPP and that's what they paid for it. Um, so that, that was kind of the reason behind doing the value, the all state agency value index. But I certainly want people to know it's not a be all end all for valuation. Um, it's designed to give you guys an idea of which way the wind is blowing as far as valuations. I tried to provide a little commentary about what I see is, is going on at all state and, and how changes may be affecting valuations. But you always got to remember, always take a little peek at that high and that low because um, just because the average may drop on your size group, it doesn't mean there aren't people out there with good books who have time to sell them and aren't distressed, you know, from a time sensitive uh, termination, getting good values. And the other thing, and I don't want to take up too much time. You can cut me off if you need, Craig. No, keep going. You're good. The, the, the other thing I tell people is spend a little time marketing your agency. You know, if, if you sell your house and you've got a nice house, people can put together a little listing pamphlet and it'll do positives and, you know, all this about the area and schools. I actually had, I wrote that, I think two quarters ago. People need to start putting something together to market their agency. I had an agent actually send me one and he was like, what do you think I put this together? And I was like, wow, I can't believe anybody's reading my uh, material. <laughs> it's kind of cool. So I, I sent it back to him. I was like, hey, you know, this is great. You covered a lot of stuff, but you didn't talk about how much money the buyer is going to make. So why don't you give some idea of like revenues, expenses, how many staff members you had? So he... Uh, put that in there, sent it back to me. And then uh, I kind of pushed it back to him a little bit because I was like, well, you know, um, based on the way you have it set up and you have a, like a, there was a staff member making like a hundred grand. And I was like, the multiple you're selling this thing for, somebody's going to borrow a million dollars and they're going to have a staff member that makes more than they do buying the business. <laughs> so you might want to work on that dynamic a little bit. But um, I don't know if that exactly answered your question, Craig. You know, I, I, it does concern me a little bit. And so when the value index comes out this next quarter, I want to make sure everybody reads it because instead of taking all this time to talk about what's going on with Allstate and why the value moves, I really wanted to address some of those high level Q and A's as far as what's the purpose of the value index? Should I be selling my 
agency for exactly the average. No, you should not be selling your agency for exactly the average. So that'll be out in less than two weeks. I've got it done. It's got to go through editing and marketing, and then it'll be up on the webpage soon. So ho hopefully that helps out a little bit. No, I appreciate that. You know, and, and that's, we're trying, I know this can get really complicated and it seems like the process gets more and more detailed. And that's exactly what we're, we're trying to help with is guide people through that. Or some people that are wanting to do it, you know, with, with confidence and have, have confidence around it and not, not be, you know, so wide open about it. So we want to help with that. But back to that index, one other thing I want you to talk about, which we talked about, you know, recently, the terminations, the, the effect that terminations have on that index and maybe what we're looking at in volume of terminations now versus even just a couple of years ago. Can you speak to that a little bit in terms of how that may be affecting a lot of the values they see on the index? Yes. And it's another reason I want folks to focus on those high and those low multiples. Um, the, the terminations have been substantial lately. Um, I don't really want to talk about the reason behind or what's going on with Allstate. There's just been a lot of terminations. Everybody knows it. You guys have heard about it. This last quarter, over 30% of the deals we did, the seller was terminated. I mean, most quarters over the last 20 years we've been lending, it's maybe one seller. Uh, over 30%, Craig. So that's substantial. And that's just uh, the ones that actually sell. There's some that are TPP that are not included in that number, correct? Of course. TPP. Of course. There's a couple of our customers who had loans with us who tried to sell this quarter and couldn't get a deal in time and there was just no extension to be had. Uh, and so those ended up taking TPP. But, you know, I specifically wrote, and I don't want to give away the farm here, but I, I didn't spend much time talking about what effective values, but term, terminations is the number one thing I wrote. Terminations remain the driving factor for the continued drop in agency values. Terminate, terminations are causing severely distressed sales to occur. Many owners are unable to reach a deal within the rigid transfer deadline, causing a TPP liquidity. So it's exactly what you said. So when you see the next value index, you got to remember about one in every three agencies that sold was part of a distressed termination sale. And I think that's a huge point, guy. You know, when you yeah. think about that, when you're looking at those numbers, because people, this happens, and I appreciate you guys putting this out. But I think sometimes people do look at that and they 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 kind of like use that as the NADA guide, you know, for the for agencies, but they're not factoring in what's going on with, with when you have terminated agencies and they've got 90 days to get rid of them, you know, it substantially affects the value. And when you have a bunch of them going through, then it brings them all down. So, you know, if you don't have that situation, you're running a clean shop and everything's going really well and it's a turnkey operation. If you can't factor that much. It's like if you're trying to sell a car that's, you know, it's got a salvage title and is going through an auction someplace versus one that's in great shape and been well maintained. It's not, it's not going to be the same value. It's two totally different things. So I think we just need to understand that. And I'm glad that you spoke about that a little bit because every time that thing gets published, it just kind of gets everybody's wheels a turn and people start commenting about how agencies have tanked and all this. And a lot of, there may be some truth to that in terms of, Maybe it has gone down some, but I think when you have 30%, that's a lot. 30% of the transactions are terminated books. Um, that's going to, that's going to take a serious hit. So I'm glad you brought that. I'm glad you spoke about that. What else we got, Allie? What other questions? I know there's a bunch of them in there. Okay. So uh, one question that's easy for Paul to answer is what is your website? Uh, yes. If you just Paul? go to, if you just go to ppcloan.com. Uh, you can see everything there, but if you're specifically looking for the Allstate Agency Value Index, there's a button at the top right that says resources, and then you just click on Allstate Resources, and it's right there. Okay, perfect. And then, Craig, what is the brokerage website? Craig Wiggins, brokerage.com. Okay. Was there a website anywhere near WigginsValuation.com? Somebody posted that. No, we'll, we'll buy it if it's available. I just don't <laughs> get right I'm on that. Buy it. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, next question. Um, how does the new merger program affect our valuation multiples if we were to sell now? So somebody's asking the question from the standpoint of if I'm a seller and I sell to somebody who's merging it, 
I'm not really what sure. they're talking about is currently what's allowed because we don't know what's going to happen with the acquisition right. merger. Right. So currently, like in my situation, I can merge these books. I think what they're asking is what would a book like if I've got two books and I merge them together and now they're eight million dollars, uh, what would that do to the valuation? I think that's going to be on a size basis, but I think you're that's totally right. To. You're totally right. And I I didn't read the whole value index, but one of the big things I write in there is small book values are desperate to be merged from a value perspective. Well, let me, let me take another like a little a spin on that. Like what about just the overall valuation going up because now this is a possibility, right? Does that automatically, whether they merge or not, now that it's an option, does that automatically raise the valuation that someone could do that if they, if they bought two locations and they did want to put them together? I think good chatter is always good and bad chatter you know it's like they what do they always say craig the uh, all ships ride rise with the tide the same thing is all ships tend to sink a little bit with the tide right, right. and when things are just really negative you're probably just going to get a little less just because maybe not a ton less but a little bit less but i think you start getting some positive information about mergers and stuff which is just a general it's just a general theme out there for agents and those looking to join the agency force I, it, I don't think it certainly won't hurt, right? It's, it's a definitely either keep it neutral or trend in a positive direction. I think it's a good thing. I, I think that when Please. people know they can do that, you know, if, even if you just look at the, just the economics of it, the ability to be able to save, just like, you know, all of us are faced with that now, I think it definitely helps. So um, I think it's, it's, start, it's definitely a good thing for sure. I think there's a lot of scratch agencies out there for the last 10 years, the scratch thing has been big, but you, you might have had an agent that came in, they were able to build the first one, the one and a half, they needed a little more cash flow, so they opened another one. Now they've got two at one and a half. Really, neither one of them are worth much on the streets to somebody, but you now put that together, you got a three, four million dollar agency. That valuation has to go up. In my opinion, if I'm purchasing it from a bank standpoint, they're going to be a little bit more conservative. But for me, if I'm an existing agent and I can get cash flow and I can just pick up this four million, it's worth way more than me going and buying one and a half and really trying to struggle to get that thing to cash flow. Cash flow is critical. I mean, sellers love to talk about their retention and staff and things, but at the end of the day, the buyer, they want to know how much money they're going to make. That's it. After I borrow a bunch of money, how much money am I going to make? It's critical. Yep. And, you know, Craig, Craig's talk, I've heard Craig talk about cash flow and whatnot all the time. I mean, we, we can never, as we're talking about these agencies and re, all these factors and stuff on the, metrics report, why not? You can never forget about how important profitability is to somebody writing the check to buy an agency. Yeah, that, that also goes depending by market too. Market in Florida compared to Indiana might have a different cash flow model. So, so that could play a big, big point. Mm -hmm. What are some things that you guys look for when purchasing a book? Any red flags to be on the lookout for? Greg, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it's the, 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 you know, demographically, you know, I mean, right out, the thing that jumps at you is, is retention. That's, that's probably one of the biggest indicators, you know, growth. And then again, look at the intangibles. What, what you know, what is, what does the staffing situation look like? To Paul's point, if you got a guy that's, you know, making a hundred thousand dollars, can you have, you know, two employees for that same price? Not to say that person isn't valuable, but are you getting the most out of that particular individual if they've been there for 30 years? I don't know the answer to that question, but one of the offices that I was going to buy Two years ago, I had people in there between 25 and 30 years. The, the you know the book was great; it had 89% retention, but it wasn't growing. So, is that business more valuable than somebody that is growing? You really have to take a look again. Cash flow is everything, but that's some of the things that really jump out to me: is is it growing? What's the retention like? And overall, what what are you getting from a turnkey solution? So, those are the some of the things I look for initially. And a couple other things is you know what's the person going to do. You know, we've had many times where people get burned where they think the person's going to retire and then they don't, they go down the street and open up an independent and, you know, just suck business off the one they just sold. Um, another thing to look for is controlled business. You know, a lot of times people don't understand when you got controlled business out there, when that transaction takes place, if that policy ends up getting canceled and it's within that three year window, they're going to charge you back for the, the commission and the bonus if that policy was needed to qualify for bonus that year. So you could have 
And I've seen them six figure chargebacks because that was not addressed when they got ready to buy that book. So there's a lot of things that you need to look for. Is it lease assumable or not? I mean, there, there's a lot of little details in there, but those that, that Greg spoke about um, and that I just mentioned, those are probably some of the bigger red flags, you know, that you, you got to, especially when someone is not of retirement age and you have just kind of a bad gut feeling about what they might be going and doing, you, you need you need to really spend a little time on that and make sure that you're not going to get caught in the bass. I've seen agents that were perennial inner circle agents that bought the wrong book. And now they're, they're almost, you know, they're just devastated because of what's happened with that new owner. And then I have seen multiple six figure chargebacks on, on policies that were canceled that were controlled business. So there's some things that you can do to make sure that you, you know, minimize those things from happening um, to you post transaction. So there's just a couple of things. What about you, Justin? You got anything that you kind of look out? I would for? add that. I mean, I had a seller once tell me that they were, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go sit my ties on the beach or whatever. You, you can do some things that will pull them out of the weeds. I said, no problem. Here's a 60 month um, non-compete, non-solicit. I said um, on the chargebacks, 36 month chargebacks, if there is any chargebacks, you'll pay me dollar for dollar for what those are. If the bonus gets charged back from previous years, you'll pay me every dollar for that. And all of a sudden, whoa, 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 well, I, I don't, you know, I don't know that I necessarily want to pay that. Well, that's fine. I just lower my valuation. Yep. If you don't, you want this amount, but you don't want to sign a non-compete, non-solicit when you told me you're going to retire, you're not going to be in the industry. We'll just pull my price down and I'll go ahead and nip that in the bud now. So I think that there's a lot of that. And if you are on the seller end of that, remember that if you've got in your head that you're going to go, I go ahead and get it out up front. You'll negotiate that up front. You don't want to get Paul already approved the buyer, all this, you get 60, 90 days deep. And now you're like, Oh, I got caught. I'm going to sign up with the Woodlands group or whatever. And it completely destroys the deal for, and everyone wastes time on that. So just have some integrity, jump out there in the early part of it and say, I'm going IA, I want two and a half times, three times, whatever it is, and make the negotiation on that end. Agreed. Okay. Um, so somebody asked, what do you guys think about the new ECP? Uh, I actually got some info on that a little bit today. I haven't seen it in person. It's very similar to our established contract. They're only going to do 300 of them across the country right now. So we're not it's very similar to the 25 and 20 we've got right now. There's a handful of little bonuses throughout there, um, but I like it. I mean, I like the established contract right now. So either way, I think, I think it's a win both ways. There's not a ton of data out there on it, and it's only going to be by certain zip codes around metropolitan areas mm -hmm. where they do that. But I did request a copy of it. I have not been sent that yet. Okay. Somebody said that they're hearing rumors that the ALR piece may change. Wait, Is there any news on that? Years. Anybody hear that? No. I, I, think think I, all the time. I, I don't I don't think anything's changing there. No. I, don't I didn't hear it either, and I'm married to an EFS. So <laughs> you heard it here first. All right. Um, so somebody was asking about um valuations basically. Um one question is, what about one agent buying another out? You know, what do you guys think about that? And then the second side to that question is another agent saying two agents talking and merging both agencies. I don't know if that's a partnership. I don't even know if that's allowed. No, so I, think, I think what they're talking about there, Allie, like for me, they're, it, if I were to buy someone down the street and they're both one and a half and putting those agencies together and making a solid agency at three or four million, I think maybe that would be that part of that question. The other part is that unknown later on this summer, maybe it's announced that, you know, if you're in a certain segmentation or something like that, that you could go purchase someone and merge them in. That's still an unknown. No one knows what that's going to be like. But in the end, I think that that's still good for the company all the way around. So that's why they're considering it. If they've got a million and a half agency out there that really just wants out, maybe they're sitting flat and they're just maybe going backwards. But yet somebody that's got a four or five million dollar agency that is growing that would like some more cash flow, they purchase an agency like this, bring it into their agency and their value goes up, their cash flow goes up, things are great for the company, for us, for the person getting out. I, I think it's going to be a win. I don't see why they wouldn't do it, but there may be strings attached, right? I could see them saying initially, like last year, or the year before, if I wanted to merge, it was you're going to merge, but you're going to take IS. I didn't do the deal. It didn't make sense at the time. 
but they may come out and say, well, we need more people on AAV. And if we're going to let you buy someone and merge them in, maybe you got to go to AAV early. You know, it could be something like that. So I'd be thinking that if that's what your, where your mindset is. Um, does anybody want to weigh in on the question? Does the new phone system play into values at all? I, I honestly don't think so, but I'll let Greg go with it. No, nope, it doesn't at all. Okay. And then when it comes to just pure acquisition, does all states still allow other agents to acquire a different agency in a different state? And if so, does anybody know the distance limitation? I think that is a, a situational based question. You know, if I were moving to Colorado for family reasons or something like that, there was a book out there somebody wanted to sell and I could buy it. I think you've got to have a compelling reason as Greg, Craig would say on why that's good for the company, not necessarily for yourself. And if that works out for them, then that's good. But I, I would say that's going to be a very small portion of things moving forward. That was a very great corporate answer, Justin. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, okay. Are the valuations based on the 9% comp change or what factor does the variable comp go into your valuations, Paul? So what I did, and I updated it a little over a year ago, if you're looking at the value index, I changed it from a multiple to a factor. So factors are now a essentially a percentage of earned premium. So if the uh, factor is 0.3 for books 4 million and up, and you have a $5 million book, then your book is worth a million five. Okay. So I took a little care previously to explain the difference between multiple and factor because when you go, 10 was really easy, right? 10 was easy math, right? Anybody could do it, even an all state agent. So, That's right. <laughs> even Justin. Yeah. Um, in Florida. But when you go to nine and then it's like, do you come up? Do you not come up? I said, look, people, eight, all state agents, independent agents talk about revenue. All state agents talk about earned premium. So what I need to do is start taking the purchase price off the purchase agreement and do it as a factor of the earned premium. And so that's what it is. Gotcha. Okay. And then uh, next question, how will the index work with Florida books that have large iVantage brokerage? Yes. So we don't have a lot of, we don't do a lot of Florida deals. I don't know why. Um, we did one last quarter. Uh, it, it is a little tough to do Florida deals. If every state was like Florida, I'd have to come up with a, with a workaround or a fix. Uh, because what happens is somebody might have 500,000 in all state revenue and 500,000 in brokered revenue. And when they sign the purchase agreement, they're like, Hey, I'm just, I'm just selling this whole book for $2 million. They don't go in and help me out and say, well, I'm selling the all state portion of the book, the 500,000 in all state revenue for 1,250,000 or two and a half times. And I'm selling the, the brokered 500,000 for 750 or one and a half times multiple. So essentially what I have to do is assume that the whole thing is a factor of the all state business. Got it. So, so what lucky, is for, lucky for us, if I ever have a quarter where uh, the Florida books, which the, the valuations always seem way out of whack, it seems too high. If I have a quarter where the, the Florida books represent more than 5%, I throw them out because it throws the index off because those okay. are such okay. unique transactions. But it would be really helpful for me if, if anybody selling a book in Florida would do two purchase agreements, one for the whole state book. I was going to say that. And one for the... That's good. Yeah, But nobody does that. It's just one purchase agreement, sell the whole thing. You're, you're going to be seeing I can't. A, lot, a lot of that, Paul. Don't worry, it's coming your way soon. That would be great. <laughs> that would be really helpful. I will, I will tell you though, when I, when I, I, you know, back in 2018 that I bought two different books in two different territories um, in March of 2018. And I, I didn't go to PPC because the value, you wouldn't give me, you wouldn't give me your limitations of what Allstate Bank would do, lend more on the expanded market for me. And right. I, had, I had no debt. So it, I had more leverage that way to be able to make that acquisition with $0 out of pocket. So it was a little different and unique situation. I think that 
you know, offline, we'll probably have to think about creative financing opportunities, especially in Florida, because my book, 60% of my, it's about 22 million, 24 million, something like that is around 60% of my book is expanded markets. But our premiums are very, very high. My average premium now is around probably 2850. Um, but, but obviously they're less than, let, let's say like in an in Ohio market, but you know, we have less to service. So it all, it, you're right. Florida is very wacky state. Florida is unique. One thing to take from that, like Paul said, I mean, if they'll just do two separate, just break it out. If the person wants 2 million, just break down a smaller multiple on that advantage, give your two and a half multiple on the all state. It makes Paul's life easier. And, and uh, that's another one of those things about negotiation. You got to learn that kind of stuff. If that's what the bank wants and you can get the most value there, do what the bank wants, make, make them happy. So. Uh, does anybody know, can an EA buy a book that is on ECP contract or only outside buyers? Man, I, I believe you can buy them, but like in my case, I was going to have to go to inter um, integrated services. Oh, yes. yeah. That's the only thing you need to factor in is if you are right. going to purchase an ECP, that may still be a factor. I haven't looked at one in about six or eight months, so I, I assume that's still the, the case. Okay. Can sellers ask for money from the assigned book that pays three and a half percent? I would, I have some of that in my book. I have probably about a million dollars of that stuff. The seated accounts is probably what they're all talking about. You, of course, can ask, like with any business, it's still revenue, you know? So I, I think it's definitely worth asking for. Um, that was it, my answer is that all state agents, well, insurance agents in general seem to be so focused on the, the health of the agency and the book of the agency and the internal reports but you have to look at it like a banker and like an agent. So yes, there's a lot on internal insurance reports that's important on a buy sell price, but there's also the cash flow. So three and a half percent is part of the revenue. That's really what somebody is buying. So right. um, you know, it's all about full disclosure, but it's right there in the profit and loss statement. So I would think that would go back to kind of Paul's thing of breaking things out. If you've got two or $3 million in seated account, you probably need to have that as a separate line. That's what this is worth. My main book's worth X and my iVantage book's worth X. And yeah. And fix that. Do you guys see terminations tailing off and valuations being able to stabilize in the future? I hope so. Man, I really, I, as far as Texas goes, I've seen it go down a lot. Um, I don't know about the rest of the country, but I actually feel like because they've got a lot of that done now, valuations will continue to rise. Okay. If an existing agent has a note with Allstate Finance from a purchase last year and they want to buy an additional book this year, will PPC finance the second purchase with the existing Allstate still active? I would have to pay it off. And if it was vice versa, we somebody had a loan with us and wanted to go with them, they'd have to pay it off. Their lien and our, our lien says the, same, says the same thing. It's all assets now owned or hereafter acquired. Right. Yeah. So um, this is very standard. Uh, we have had a situation where, and this is a little unique, but where somebody was able to do separate corporation in different states. So we lent on the Florida business and then some another bank lent on their Texas business with a different corporation. Not oh. sure how they functionally did that with Allstate, but if you're- so this this is a similar question, but I'll take this one. It says, if you have a prepayment penalty with another lender, does it make sense to work with PPC on a loan to refi an existing book and merge a new book? The other lender is making it seem that the prepayment penalty just doesn't make sense to go elsewhere. Again, that's a financial decision, you guys. Like, yeah. I mean, you've got to look at, even if you were just refinancing, but your loan is you know, 9% and now you can refinance at six, you, you have to think about how long will I be here to save that 6% because if you're going to sell in two years, you probably don't want to pay that big prepayment penalty to refinance and cash is king. So if you can shave 3% off your rate by, you know, refinancing and then even maybe even spreading out your amortization out back out to 10 years, and then you can reinvest back into the business and grow or invest it elsewhere. You, but you, it's a, there isn't going to be a, a universal formula for everyone to make that decision. It's, it's going to be case by case and actual data that will help you make that decision. So don't listen to the previous lender on. They're like, oh, you shouldn't go anywhere. Ask them for the financials to back that statement 
And then also don't listen to the, the new loan guy that's trying to sell you a new loan that it makes sense to eat the prepayment payment penalty. You gotta, you gotta make these decisions off of pure fact and financials and not just somebody convincing you one way or the other. Um, John is curious if how a book on integrated services would impact the value of books. Anyone? I would let Paul take that one. Maybe yeah. if You know, I produce the Allstate Agency Value Index, and I talk about what drives values, but I never, I'm not a part of the equation for setting the price. I let the, the market does that, right? So I am involved in determining how much I'll lend or how I'm comfortable structuring a deal. Um, it may feel like to the market that I have a lot of um, control or input in the valuations or which way they trend. I'm really just reflecting back to the market I'd be interested to see what the market of buyers feels um, they would do to the values. I would have to look at the cash flow of the businesses to see how it affects the bottom line, because that's essentially what I'm lending on, right? right. So if you have money going, being retained by Allstate for integrative services costs, but on the um, agent's income statement, those costs, that co outflow cost is offset by a reduction in staff or you've got better opportunity to focus on selling new business so it ends up if it ends up being a wash i'm going to lend the same i would assume that the market would continue to consume these businesses in the same manner at the same multiples but i couldn't make a firm statement on that because that's up to the market to decide how they want to purchase i think what i'm hearing i mean it's just back to cash flow again if it's cash flowing he can lend on yeah right well that's a really good question paul so i guess have you, have you done any transactions that you know of involve integrated services? And if you have, has anybody seen the comp statement? Is that shown as an expense to the agent or they get a reduction in commission? I, 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 that's a good, I don't know the answer to that question. So our chief credit officer, Stephen Kemper, definitely knows the answer to that question. Um, I know that we've had a couple of customers come to us and say that they were considering doing a transaction where they would um, be required to go into integrative services. I think we got one approved and then they end up backing out. Um, we, we honestly don't have a lot of experience with it, uh, either from an existing customer or a new customer standpoint. I think people wanted to do mergers and different things, but I think they, for the most part, tried to stay um, away from away participating from, yeah, yeah. In services, but yeah, I'm, I'm really anxious to see how it all plays out. Yeah. We'll, we'll put um, that on the parking lot for us to do some due diligence on that. Yeah. I mean, that's when, kind of a time will tell type thing. Yeah. Um, when looking at cash flow, what term lengths of loans are buyers looking at cash flow looks much different, you know, between a five year or 12 year term, what are you finding the typical loan term is? We do 10 year on pretty much every deal. So we do 10 year fixed. Okay. Uh, that seems to give the buyer plenty of room to reinvest in their business and grow based on market valuations. And, you know, if they don't see opportunity for growth, they can maybe put a little bit extra to the back to the loan and pay it off early, but almost a hundred percent are doing 10 year. Okay. Somebody just made a comment that all states said that IS is an expense and will not affect TPP. So those are two different I feel like those are two different ball games. Like, you know, you've got payroll as an expense when we talk about profit and loss and cash flow and how a bank is going to look at it. If you already have, let's say, a four hundred thousand dollar payroll expense, and then you go and do IS, and then you have a new expense line for IS, it's supposed to, in essence, replace some of your payroll. So if you don't change your payroll, but yet you absorb IS, your expenses have gone up, your cash flow profit has shrunk and you're less likely to be able to have a buyer that can hold a note. There's just simply not enough money there. And that's what a bank would look at. So that's, if, if you're on IS, then your payroll needs to be trim because they're, they should be doing your service for you. So that's kind of a, a good way to look at it. Um, if you own a, if you own one $3 million agency and you're looking for growth, how can you determine if acquisition is a good option, assuming you still owe money on your existing agency? Say, say that one more time, Allie. 
If you own one $3 million agency and looking for growth, how can you determine if acquisition is a good option, assuming oh. you still owe money on your existing agency? Well, look, I think that the thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about acquiring a book, you're buying a book one way or the other. <laughs> you're buying it through staffing and marketing or you're buying a known. And I think if you're at 3 million, and you're trying to get to five, six, seven, eight, whatever. I think Justin said it earlier. The fastest way to get there is to acquire another book. If you can do it, especially if things open up where you can buy that and merge that in, you're basically just buying that premium. You're already doing that. You're already paying for marketing and staffing. The difference is you don't know what you're getting. You're hoping you know what you're getting, but you don't really know. Um, so I think as long as your timeline is one where you know you're going to be here for a while and be able to pay that off and, and do it where you can benefit from you know, that, that asset being free and clear. Um, again, I think it, it also does, depends on your personal goals and what you want to give up. There's a lot of factors there, but if you're trying to scale, if you're trying to grow, acquisitions is one of the best ways to do it. A lot of people have made a lot of generational wealth by doing just that. And sometimes you got to have a little courage and jump out there and maybe take some chances, but you're still doing the same thing with everything else. Maybe you can cut off marketing and staffing a little bit quicker so you're not like committed to that like you are when you buy a book, but it's basically the same thing. Yep. Do you know if there's a size book that still requires agents to go IS for a purchase? Is it like under one and a half million still? Oh, under one and a half million. Okay. Under one and a half million going on IS, going on ECP though. So you should be able to buy a $1.4 million book that doesn't go have ECP. And if you want to do the 25 and 20 and be established, I believe they are allowing that Okay. Ask your FSL. If that's something that you're looking at, I would look at that. Yeah. So somebody said if you're going IA, but over 150 miles away from the current location, does that still come into play on the sales price? I'll just give my opinion on that. And others can wait. I would say absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. All day. Doesn't matter. I don't care what part of the country they're going to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that would be outside. That would be outside a, an appropriate covenant not to compete radius correct but from a covenant not to solicit standpoint you can call a customer from pretty much any location in the united states so if i was doing that deal and somebody told me they wanted to go ia the covenant not to come the covenant not to solicit would have to be very substantial with built-in dollar penalties exactly and i think that's good to point out because a lot of banks and um, in paul's case i assume that y'all want the exact same thing there's going to be documentation that addresses all this or the bank's not going to loan on it in a lot of cases you know we spend a lot we we probably spend more time than most banks reviewing the purchase agreement and the various language within the purchase agreement because you'll be surprised how many times agents will show up to buy an agency and they'll be looking to buy, borrow a million sometimes two million dollars and they have no covenant not to solicit right. i'm like that's great that they can't compete against you next door, but you just essentially allowed them to call every customer one day after the, <laughs> they're like, really? No, yeah. But yeah, it's two different things. You have to have a covenant not to compete and a covenant not to solicit. Yep. And I would say covenant not to solicit in the Allstate world is more important because there's all, there's insurance agencies everywhere. That's yep. right. The likelihood of them setting up shop wherever and one of your customers just randomly walking into the location or having some great relationship with them is pretty low. Really do not want anybody calling the customers that I just paid a lot of money for. Yeah. Hey, Paul, why do you underwrite on earned premium instead of written advanced? That's a good question. Uh, we actually underwrite on the actual cash flow of the business, the revenues and expenses, but I had to have a benchmark for um, what our lending cap would be. And so instead of coming in and saying, hey, we'll do two times revenue or two and a quarter earned and written, or we just said, look, the max we'll do is two and a half times earned premium. So it's it's a little bit arbitrary. A lot of lenders out there are like, we'll do 1.25 times TPP is our max. Um, that's just our max. It doesn't determine, it just says that's the max we can ever lend. It, it doesn't, it isn't really a factor in our decision-making process other than it's a ceiling we don't go above. When I'm actually underwriting the deal, I'm looking at revenues, expenses, growth or shrinkage, retention, how much does the buyer need to take out? Do they have good credit? You know, those types of things. 
Um, so next question is, is the, do you guys think the new merger program is going to increase our values since there appears to be less restrictions? Personal opinion, yes. I mean, there's nothing I can put in stone on that, but I personally feel it's going to help all state all the way around. Just selfishly, the agents. I mean, I really think this is a big win for a long time. We've been looking for a win over the last 18, 24 months. This is a win for us. And I think it's going to go up. I think those valuations are going to go up. We'll be talking to Paul and, you know, maybe we're at four times schools in a year or two. I mean, it, it could I think be from a, Oh, sorry, Justin. Oh, no, you're fine. I think strictly from a supply and demand standpoint, it's a positive, right? Because you could make an argument right now. We have too much seller supply, not enough buyer demand. Right. And so when you merge, you're at least reducing some of the supply. Yep. And then on the demand side, I think it'll be make them more attractive. Agree. So I know we touched on this, but I just want to make sure this was completely answered. When merging two books, they're doing roll, they're basically doing roll-ups and, and merger, which I, you know, unless it was an ECP and an existing, you should probably already be rolled up anyways. This person is basically saying, can the two books be split and sold separate in the future? But the only one the location. What they're talking about right now, you roll up. So you'll have a, a primary, but then I still have four locations under established locations that roll up into this primary. So I can sell off one of those books, but uh -huh. this is a true merger, y'all. It's the way it is structured right now. I would prefer it be some kind of co-location, but right now they are saying it's going to roll up into one agent number period my only asterisk that i've got for me that i'm going to say is that's fine if that's the only way we can do it i still want to do it but i want to have a sub producer code number of 111 for my forney location i want sub producer code 222 for rockwall and then later on i'll be able to push you know do a report in business metrics on just that sub producer code it'll show all your retentions the bundling everything for that location alone if I ever want to sell it off. That is not my preferred. My preferred would be a co-location. The one thing, I still have an ECP and I'm gonna merge it in at the end of this year as well when the lease is up. The one thing that they have not given me answers on that I'm looking for, looking forward to hear, typically on an ECP, you go five years before you get your TPP. I'm curious when I roll in, do I get my TPP right away? Since I'm now making that established and giving up that extra incentive. So. That's something to consider when you're talking to your FSL. Hopefully they get an answer to us on that pretty soon. Do we, Paul, do you calculate the annual bonus in the valuations? Uh, no, the, the all state agency value index is a uh, factor of the purchase price as the numerator and the earned premium of the agency as the denominator. But I will say this, an agency who achieves bonus on a regular basis, so a quality agency, is likely to get a higher factor or a higher multiple. Right. But it's that revenue stream is not built into the purchase price. Okay. Question for Greg. Allstate has said that elite tier agents will receive higher commissions. When will this information be released? I mean, I believe, uh, first of all, I don't know that to be factual or not. Even if I do, I couldn't d disclose that. I'm sorry because of the NDA, but um, I believe that that's a work in progress and they're probably going to give some information on any changes to segmentation or any type of compensation. Historically, we've seen in October because I think they have to what give us 90 days before any type of comp changes happen. So I, if my, it was my best guess, theoretically, it would probably be in October. Okay. Um, somebody said, if I'm on IS and I purchase a book, will the new book have to go on IS as well? I believe that's a yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. And then, um, let's see. So Paul, are you doing 9% on the 12 month mover earn premium or 10 or somewhere in between is the question. Uh I'm assuming they're talking about our lending cap. I think they're talking about where you talked about earlier on the factor, on how you're using a factor of and not necessarily 10 yes. to 9%. So, so the value index is just purchase price relative to earned premium. And so if you converted your book, you said, well, earned premium times 9%, the 
fact the multiple would look higher than the factor. Correct. That makes sense. We're kind of getting a little deep here in some mathematics. As far as what I'm lending, and I don't know if this is where the question was going. As far as what I'm lending, yes, the maximum I can lend for an outside buyer is two and a half times a nine percent of the earned premium. There you go. Okay. Um, so there's 25 questions left. So I'm going to try to do some rapid fire to try to get to everybody. Um, this question is, um, for the panel, would you merge multiple locations into one if they were all within a 40 mile limit? That was, that was answered and this will be recorded and posted unless somebody wants to say something real fast or you I'm just want to refer back to the previous answer. Okay. It, Kevin, it's at the very beginning. Justin answers it. It'll be on the platform. Um, do you think an elite agency will be able to demand a higher multiple? Anyone? I would I would assume so. I, I'm if I were to sell today, guys, in some and I really am going to get out of insurance. I'm probably asking four four and a half times at on a probably a ten percent multiple since that's how our TPP is still structured. Like I'm going to ask for a lot. My agency's well oiled. There's not going to be any reason for me to take them with me. And I might even stay on for a year just to make sure to prove that, you know, but I'm going to ask for a high, high number. I'm not asking two times at 9% and just going down the road and whatever. I mean, if you're an elite agent and you are, you've got the proof is in the pudding and I'm going to ask for a top, top dollar. I mean, it's like anything else, but I've got one of the best houses on the street. I'm asking top dollar. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm kind of with you guys. I sold last July of 2020 and I never, once read a value index. I never once asked somebody for their opinion. I, 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 I know what my, my walking number looks like. I would have stayed if I hadn't have gotten it. Um, my, my, the health of my agency was beautiful. It was a well-oiled machine. Cost of overhead was low. I ran a trim agency as far as expenses go. And when I walked out in July, They've never called me since for support so, and I'm, I'm right here and, and I love the buyer and I would do anything he needed me to, but it's, it was so well oiled and he knew what he was doing that, that all plays into the factor. So somebody asked what size book would you stay away from two and a half million below again, guys, it's going to vary two and a half million in Ohio, where you might be able to rent a place for $800 a month for commercial. It's one thing. You go down to Miami, Florida, try to be by Greg Blanchard, you might be at three grand <laughs> a month. Two and a half million ain't gonna cut it. Like you're gonna have to live on a, you're gonna have to live on a houseboat. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's it's all gonna matter of what that cost of running that business is. Are your employees at a fifteen dollar minimum wage or a seven, like Alabama? So it just it just depends on Both where up. you live. Both there up. is yeah. there is no formula. Look, I, let me just yeah. say something to all of that, what you guys just talked. There's a huge difference between agencies. You know, everybody likes to try to say, you know, what's this one worth? What size? It, it, it can totally vary based on how well that agency runs and what kind of people are in there. And is it turnkey or has it got problems? If you're thinking about selling and, and you have an agency that has problems now, just like if you had a house with a bunch of busted windows and holes in the roof, go get all that stuff fixed then try to sell it. And you're going to get a much better price than trying to sell something that's got a bunch of problems. So yes, elite agencies are going to bring more bigger, more profitable agencies are going to bring more, you know, first of all, a lot of those owners, unless it's the TPP, they're not going to let them go. Like Justin, myself, great. We're not selling these books for less than three times. I mean, I, I never would. I wouldn't even consider it. I would like, because the cash flow is enough where, you know, it's kicking off enough to keep it you know, make it, it's, it's, it's still a viable investment, right? So if you're out there and you're on the fence about selling and you got issues with your agency, I would definitely try to fix those things first and you'll get more. And you may go through a few months of pain to get it there, but you're definitely going to get your money back in return. And if you're looking at buying books out there, you definitely have to consider all that. You can't just look at a business metrics report and determine what it's worth. There's a lot more that goes into that. I've seen situations where the leases were just ridiculous, but the guys tied into it, you know, for seven more years or nothing to do to get out of it. That, that is going to affect your cash flow. or yeah, they got staff there and they're all going to leave. They don't know it, or they don't have any leadership ability to help. There's just so many different things. So it's hard to say this is what they're worth and just put your finger on it based off of a report or off size. And I think it's really important. Everybody understands that. 
Has anyone ever heard of a TPP agent selling a flood book separately? No. No. Okay. Left it, left it was expanded market, but I don't, most of the stuff I think we write company wide is an all state paper, but I know there's some places in Connecticut and New York that probably might write through right flood or whoever. Does anybody know the rules of a spouse purchasing an agency? As long as they they're approved, they're approved. If they're approved, they're approved. If they're buyer, yeah, they can buy it. different. We finance lots of spouses to purchase. Okay. Um, so somebody said, has there been any talk of spousal mergers if you have a husband and wife agency and putting those together? No, not yet. I would, I would think that would be the purchase and acquisition mergers later on that they're going to address. That would probably fall into that. Yeah. And the same thing for the partnership that I discussed earlier, two agents trying to become one. Yep. Okay. All right. And then... Somebody said, do you believe all state agency purge will end in 2021? Or do you believe the three tiers will reset next year with a new bottom half or tier? Uh, maybe Greg touch on it, but the way I believe it is whatever we finish this year, you get the entire year to stay at that. And then however you finish that year will determine what goes into 2023. Yeah, so the, I, I, th I think that it depends on, again, where you uh, land in the segmentation. Again, guys, I don't know what home office is going to do. I know things that they're talking about in terms of um, how people land in the segmentation, but I believe you'll watch what they do, not watch what they say. And if it, something does come out with a comp change in October, you're good for this year, but you do have a chance to reset. And then, listen, there's a lot of people that right now might want to make a decision to go ahead and sell because their time horizon is different. So it really depends on a case by case, you know, situation and basis. Someone said, and if the elite buys an emerging agency, does that impact the elite status? It can, it, if they do like a blended balance calculation. Um, has anybody done a deal where a couple smaller books were merged into an existing agency? Any of you done that? Um, no, I have not. A couple of smaller books, but what'd you say? Merging into an existing agency. No, not allowed. Remember? Mm -hmm. so. I don't know. We've had we'd have we've had multiple deals this last quarter where an existing agent merged medium to small size books in. I don't know if they merged multiple books in at the same time. I thought we had one where an existing agent bought two, but I know we've had multiple deals where an existing agent bought at least one to merge. And I think again, where somebody gave an answer earlier, it has to make sense to the company. So for example, I merged two agency years ago when mergers were like, like a word you couldn't say at all state, but they allowed me to because we had outgrown our location with two agencies. And so now there was a, literally two all state offices right next to each other and I was one of them. So I was like, can I go please and save $3,000 in overhead and I'll reinvest it. And I did a business plan. I hired more people. So it has to be a win-win for the company on something like that. Um, so there's about 16 questions left. I've taken pictures of all of them and because some are for Paul, some are for Greg. So I'll distribute those and make sure that those all get answered. But before I let somebody take it home, I just want to say I buy a lot of investment real estate. And so maybe that's where this comes from, guys. But your book is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. Okay. I just bought a house. There were 14 bids. It's supply and demand. But quite frankly, what I paid for it and what I got, it was worth it because the rental income I can get off of it, it was worth it. It made sense. So all of these things may or may not affect valuations. IS, AAV, Tom Wilson's here. Tom Wilson's not here. I don't know. Like there's a lot, but your book is your book and it depends on what your PL looks like, what your business metrics looks like. And if you put it out there for sale at four times and somebody buys it, great. But that's because somebody was willing to pay four times. You might put it out there two times and you don't have a buyer because no one in your city wants to be an all state agent. It happens. So it's only as worth as much as somebody's willing to pay for it. I mean, you, obviously you need a professional broker to help you evaluate and have a benchmark and a starting point. So you don't over ask or under ask, but really there has to be a buyer as well, which a broker can also help with because people don't usually post on their social media. Hey, I'm looking to buy an insurance agency, but that's where these guys come in because they can connect 
maybe the buyer who already is an agent is like, I'm looking to buy, but I don't want to say anything because I don't want my leadership in my business. They know these things and they can connect buyers and sellers. So that's what you need help with is someone to help you set that value because there is no formula and bring you a buyer. So on that note, I'm done. <laughs> Allie, thanks for moderating, and, and I appreciate you guys jumping on the call with us today. I appreciate Paul, you know, spending over an hour answering Q&A. They do a great job, you know, and, and they may not always be the lender for everybody, um, but I know they do a really good job, and they get deals done pretty quickly, and he understands what it takes to make that happen, which is really important. The last thing you want to do is drag a, a deal out forever, and then it fall apart at the last minute because somebody doesn't know what they're doing, and there are some, I've, I've been involved in and deals like that before where it didn't work out because they didn't know what they were doing. And, um, and frankly, they actually got involved in one of those and, and, and bail one of those people out. So I appreciate the work that he does and his willingness to come on, you know, and answer these questions. And obviously there's a lot of interest in this and we will do some more of these. You know, this is definitely a topic, especially as things progress with all these rules and changes. And, and I'll say this, I think what happened with the mergers, I think is a very, very positive thing. I think a lot of people when it was first being, proposed we're expecting it to have some really tight guidelines and maybe only be you know eligible to folks in the elite segment and the fact that it was open to everybody and is open to everybody now well within some you know some guidelines um i think that says a lot and, and I'm, I'm really excited about that and glad that's where you know where things are headed look if we can help you if justin greg myself ali any of us can help you reach out anytime and uh, we'll be glad to help you any way that we can and paul once again, man, thanks for coming on and, and spending time with us today. And um, we'll do this again soon. Maybe another few weeks down the road as more things progress, we'll, uh, we'll jump on another call and answer some more questions. So appreciate you guys. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye, thanks, guys. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Bye, guys. See ya. Bye.